Alrighty. Good afternoon to everyone. My name is Ken. I'm here with Linkso. Thank you for being here this afternoon uh, via our virtual uh, clinic. Um, and a lot of familiar names here. And uh, thank you for attending. Um, we have a very exciting talk today uh, by the Sierra Club. Uh, Mary will be presenting. Before that, I'm just going to go over quick housekeeping tips. Just make sure to have your mics muted and you can turn off your video if you don't want to be on video. Um, it's not obligated that you are. Um, the chat session, feel free to use that to ask any questions towards the end of the presentation. I'll be reading out the questions and Mary will be addressing them. Um, and uh, we do have a hard cutoff around uh, 2.30. We may be able to go just a couple minutes over, but I think the presentation should take about an hour or so, and then we'll have a good 30 minutes Q&A. Uh, for those questions that we don't get, get to today, what we'll do is we'll go ahead and address them via email. Um, so if you'd like to get for us to get back to you, just go ahead and uh, send us a private message um, or we'll download the, the transcript and try to get back to you if you're registered um, via Eventbrite. So uh, with that being said, I'm going to turn the meeting over to Mary from the Sierra Club and uh, she's going to start our, start our meeting today. Right. Well, I'm really pleased to be here and I just want to say thank you so much to all of you for coming and attending. It's really exciting to be able to share about the importance of healthy soils and that's part of our mission at the California Sierra Club Sustainable Agriculture Committee. I'm the chair of that committee and part of our mission is, is education and outreach and so being able to present to so many people on this crucial topic, it's a real honor. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and dive right into the presentation that I'm going to give today. And as Ken said, at the end, I'll have a chance to answer questions. We should have at least around um, 20 or 30 minutes to answer questions. So I'll have a chance to get into a little bit of a discussion. So I'll go ahead and share my screen. And Ken, we're able to see the slides. Get on my side. Yep. All right. Excellent. Okay, so today's uh, presentation is about the topic of healthy soil for a healthy planet. And healthy soil is absolutely critical to a healthy planet. It affects agriculture, it affects climate change, it affects so many aspects of our life and the life of the whole environment. And I think a lot of people know um, a bit about soil. There might be a lot of people here who know a lot about soil. And I'm wondering if I can just start the presentation by asking a question, which is, um, why is soil important? And if you want to take a couple seconds to write in the chat why you think soil is important, I'm really curious to see people's responses. So please go ahead and write your thoughts on that. Right, I see lots of responses coming in on the chat. That's great. Um, let me see if I can actually see those messages. Yeah, yeah, it sustains life, food security, it feeds plants, it grows food, um, vital to the ecosystem, keeps the plant healthy. These are all great. And I'm seeing, one, one thing I'm seeing come up over and over again in the chat, here's the word life. And I think someone even wrote soil is life. And I think, yeah, that was Susan. So thank you, Susan, because that's absolutely correct. Soil is life, it's full of life um, and it supports life. It's essential to all life on earth. So um, just to dive into the details a little bit more Soil's importance includes that it's vital as a source of life. Um, it provides nutrients, it stores nutrients and minerals within the soil that then plants can use um, and access. And it also holds life inside it more literally in the sense that soil is full of tremendous biodiversity, whether it's microorganisms, bacteria, fungi, tiny, tiny mites and insects that we can't see with the naked eye there's a huge amount of biodiversity beneath the soil that most people rarely think about, um, which I think is really cool. It's also, of course, a physical foundation. And this is a physical foundation for plants. Their roots, of course, are attached to the soil. Without soil, it's hard to have plants. Um, 
but it's also a physical foundation for all kinds of other things that we see around us. Our houses, roads, bridges are all built on the soil. So it's a physical foundation for everything. It's also critical for our water cycle. And I think in California, we know the importance of water. And that's because we often uh, don't have access to it or we don't have enough of it due to so much drought in this state. But soil is critical to the hydrological cycle. It can absorb water when it's a healthy structured soil. It can store water for later use by plants. It purifies water as the soil um, takes the water through and it filters through the complex structure and biology of the soil. And then because it's storing it, it can release it later for plants to use to grow. So soil is, is crucial for water. And of course, one thing I'll be digging in quite deeply in this talk is that soil stores carbon. It's a very important store of carbon on the planet, but unfortunately it also means that it can be a source of carbon. So the biggest way that we are probably encountering the soil in our daily life, aside from walking on it, is via agriculture and, and via the food that we're eating from day to day. Agriculture is of course crucial to the economy. It's crucial to our food security. And in California, we especially know how important agriculture is because California is supplying almost half of all the fruits, nuts, and vegetables in the US. So we have a very special role to play in the US in terms of our agriculture. But this means that agriculture also has a really big impact in California. It um, takes up over 43 million acres of land in our state, and it's a significant contributor to greenhouse gases. It contributes about 8% of the greenhouse gases in California, and this is less than uh, transportation and fossil fuels, but it's still significant. And nationwide, agriculture contributes about 10% of greenhouse gas emissions. Imagine how exciting it would be if we could reduce 10% of those greenhouse gas emissions just by changing our agricultural practices. So of course, this also means that agriculture is a huge climate mitigation opportunity. Um, and I want to take a, a little bit of a side note into a really crucial topic, which is the social impacts of agriculture. I think as in this presentation, people often are going to focus on the environmental impacts of agriculture, and that is crucial. But it's important to remember that agriculture is a livelihood and people are employed in agriculture, people have their careers in agriculture, and agriculture has a direct impact on human health. One super important example of this is farm workers. And we've seen with the COVID-19 pandemic, the recognition of farm workers as essential workers. But of course, it shouldn't have taken a global pandemic for us to recognize how crucial the work of farm workers is. And so whenever we think about agricultural practices, it's crucial to think about their social impacts as well on the livelihood of farm workers and on their health. Of course, agriculture also has an impact on everyone's health by determining what food is available and even the nutrition of that food. Because plants get their nutrients from the soil, if that soil is very low in nutrients and devoid of, of minerals and nutrients, it's going to be very hard for the plant to make uh, a fruit or a, a green that's going to be nourishing for human bodies. So soil also impacts the nutrition we receive. And finally, it's an economic impact as well. Agriculture is crucial to California's economy as a state, it's crucial to our national economy. And even when we look at that aggregate of the whole economy, all of that is made up of individual farmers whose livelihood and whose profitability is really determined by the conditions that impact agriculture. So it's always remember, important to remember that agriculture is really based on people, not just soil. Now, digging in a little bit more to the environmental impacts, I think people are increasingly aware of some of the negative environmental impacts of agriculture. And don't worry, it doesn't just have negative impacts and we'll get into that, but just to go over a few of them, agriculture can lead to acute air pollution um, when gas from fertilizer comes off of a field or gas from pesticides, this can lead to impacts like asthma and surrounding communities. It can also create acute water pollution. For example, when too much fertilizer is applied, water washes it off the field and it goes into nearby bodies of water. This is one of the great lakes here and you can see the algal blooms that have happened due to too much fertilizer getting in the water. And those algal blooms can be toxic and sort of suffocate the, the aquatic life. Now agriculture when it expands can also lead to habitat loss, which is really you know, detrimental to wildlife and can lead to the loss of wild biodiversity. And one last thing I want to mention here that a lot of people don't think about is that 
the way we farm today with industrial agriculture, focusing on monocropping, in other words, one crop in a very large area, monocropping, it leads to a loss of agricultural biodiversity as well. In the past, there was a much broader array of different crops that were grown that were suited to different climates that were suited for different purposes. And now as industrial agriculture focuses more and more on just a few crops and a few varieties, that agricultural biodiversity is in danger of being lost. And we don't have to look that far back into our past as a country to see the impacts of agriculture in the most negative light. Um, we can look back to the Dust Bowl and the Great Depression for evidence of that. You can see in this picture, it's pretty devastating. There's tumbleweeds blowing around and dust. And this occurred in part because um, of farmers engaging in a lot of tillage, plowing, turning over and breaking up that soil, which led to the soil becoming very loose and easy to erode um, and really led to a collapse of agricultural production. So, you know, it was not that long ago in our, in our history um, that this kind of impact occurred. And I know my mom who grew up in, um, in Nevada and then went to school later in Taft in Southern California has told me about um, going to school with the children and grandchildren of people who were forced to migrate due to the Dust Bowl. So it wasn't that long ago. Nowadays, we don't see the dust bowl anymore, but there's other environmental impacts that are just as significant that are stemming from agriculture, but they're less easy to see. And of course, I'm talking about climate change. And we here in California, even in the Bay Area, are already experiencing the impacts of climate change. The drought, the wildfires, this year has been a disastrous wildfire season and uh, between a combination of the dry fuel loads and that bizarre lightning storm that happened a few months ago, we are seeing the, the way that climate change impacts the weather to lead to really, really unfortunate outcomes. And we're now at 410 parts per million of carbon dioxide. So how did we get to this point? Well, there's a few different answers. One, of course, is burning fossil fuels. And this is probably the best known and the most significant contributor. We've also gotten here because of the destruction of ecosystems, including the destruction of the soils underlying those ecosystems and the destruction of forest deforestation. All of this releases huge amounts of carbon. And of course, there's a tie into agriculture. The degradation of agricultural soil has been a really significant contributor to climate change. In fact, agricultural and forestry activities probably generate today around 24% of greenhouse gas emissions worldwide. But you know we are not uh, defenseless against climate change. There is hope to fight off some of those worst effects of climate change. And we can do that by mitigating these climate changes and reducing the amount of greenhouse gases that are in our atmosphere. When we talk about mitigating climate change, there's two sides of the coin of mitigating climate change. And those are avoiding emissions. So reducing the amount of greenhouse gases that's going into the air in the first place. And then there is sequestering carbon, taking carbon out of the atmosphere. And in order to fight climate change, we have to be doing both of those things because we already have such a high level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. The best ways to avoid emissions include replacing fossil fuels with renewable energy, protecting those wild carbon rich ecosystems like wetlands or seagrass areas, um, and then reducing agricultural related emissions, including the ongoing loss of soil carbon. On the flip side of that coin with sequestering carbon, we have great um, things like restoring those carbon rich ecosystems, including their soils. We also have a lot of um, really exciting upcoming carbon capture and storage technologies. Now, a lot of these are still unproven. The science is still out. They are very exciting, but they also tend to be very costly. And so it's excellent that we have an option to turn to that's not particularly costly, that produces amazing benefits along with the same practices, um, and is something that we are really already very well aware of and have a lot of scientific evidence to back up, and that is returning carbon to agricultural soils, which is the exciting topic of our presentation. So before we zoom in just on the agricultural soils and their relationship with atmospheric carbon, I want to take a brief look at the broader food system and how we as individuals can um, really have an impact on our carbon and greenhouse gas footprint in the overall food system. One of the best things that individuals can do is reduce food waste. And 
Um, you'll get a, a PDF version of this presentation later where you'll be able to click on links and you can see here there's a link to all kinds of great tips for reducing food waste. But I'll tell you my favorite one. Um, my boyfriend and I have Saturday as our leftovers day and we go through our fridge, pull out all the little odds and ends of things that we cook but didn't quite finish during the week, have those for lunch, and then all the leftover vegetables. We have a big salad for dinner on Saturday. So that really helps us cut down on our food waste and also neither of us have to cook on Saturday. So that's always fun. And then if you can compost waste that you can't avoid, um, that's also a big benefit for your greenhouse gas footprint. Uh, it's easy, of course, if you have municipal composting, but it's also possible to compost at home. And I imagine uh, Lingso might have some good resources on that. Um, it's also wonderful if you can reduce your meat consumption since meat has a pretty big greenhouse gas footprint. And it's excellent if you can seek out regeneratively grown foods, which is the main topic of of today's presentation. So let's focus in now on the science behind what exactly is happening when I talk about carbon sequestration in the soil. What does that mean? Where's the carbon coming from and how does it get into the soil and how does it stay there? So I find it really helpful to think of the carbon on the earth as residing in what are called different pools. In other words, different individual places where that carbon is stored. There's a finite amount of carbon basically on the earth. It's not spontaneously being created and it's not suddenly disappearing, but rather it's moving between these different pools. And when carbon is in some of these pools, for example, the atmosphere, carbon can produce really negative effects like global warming. When carbon is present in the oceans in high levels where it is absorbed out of the atmosphere, it acidifies the oceans and creates great harm to marine life, um, for example, corals. But there's other places and other pools of carbon here that are actually not at all harmful for the carbon to be, um, where carbon can actually play a really beneficial role. And I'm talking here primarily about the soil and the biota, those green circles that you see. The biota, of course, is referring to all the living things on the earth. So I am a biota, you are a biota, um, the trees outside, the microorganisms are biota, and we're all carbon-based life forms. So aside from water, we are primarily made of, of carbon. And when the carbon from the biota dies, when those biota die or when they put roots down into the soil, they're adding that carbon into the soil, which is how the soil carbon pool can grow. And we'll talk a little bit about how agriculture mediates these pathways. So one way that agriculture has an impact on these, on these pools is uh, by moving carbon into the atmosphere. And this happens in a couple different ways. Um, one is through fossil fuel emissions. Now I've, I have a tractor here. Fossil fuel emissions do mean the fossil fuel emissions from machinery running in the fields. But actually more important than that is the energy that goes into producing synthetic agricultural inputs. A lot of that energy of course is based on fossil fuels. And when we produce, um, for example, nitrogen fertilizer using these energy intensive processes, that uses up a huge amount of fossil fuels and puts carbon in the atmosphere. Just to put it in perspective, um, one of the natural processes by which nitrogen is transferred from the air into a form that's usable by plants in the soil is when there's a lightning strike. And that lightning strike can break apart some of those nitrogens in the air and make them accessible. So in order to produce nitrogen fertilizer, we need to have the same amount of energy as in a lightning strike. So think about how much energy that's using up. Another way that agriculture mediates these pathways is kind of directly through the soil. So because soil has organic matter in it from those dead living organisms um, or roots or microorganisms that are living in the soil, um, when that soil is turned over and the carbon molecules in the soil are exposed to the air, those can oxidize with the oxygen in the atmosphere and form carbon dioxide, the most famous greenhouse gas. So when the soil is disturbed, we get carbon dioxide. The other way is when we apply um, nitrogen-based fertilizer to the soil, that can also oxidize, um, especially when there's excess fertilizer applied. And that oxidation leads to nitrous oxide, which is an extremely powerful greenhouse gas, actually more powerful than carbon. And the third pathway I want to talk about is livestock. 
um, especially cattle, because they have a special way of digesting grass that involves fermenting it in one of their many stomachs. Um, they ferment this grass that we certainly wouldn't be able to eat. And in order to make it edible, the process produces um, quite a bit of methane, which they then expel into the atmosphere. And then the waste from um, livestock also is going to allow nitrogen to escape into the atmosphere. So these are kind of the three main pathways by which um, agriculture is leading to carbon and other greenhouse gases entering the atmosphere. But agriculture and photosynthesis in general is also an amazing way to take carbon out of the atmosphere and put it back into the soil where it's safe and helpful. And the underlying, um, the underlying process for this is photosynthesis. And when photosynthesis occurs, the plants are using CO2 from the atmosphere. They're taking it out of the atmosphere, bringing it into their leaves, and they split it up. And then they use that carbon to form the structures of, of their bodies and also to create sugars, which they then exude through their roots. And they give that um, those sugars to microorganisms such as fungus in the soil which, wow, they're so nice, right? These altruistic plants. But in fact, it's more of a trade because those fungi are then bringing nutrients from farther abroad in the soil to the roots of the plants. So it's sort of a, a really cool exchange that they do. And as the plants put down more and more sugar into the soil, they are you know, um, vitalizing those fungi, those microorganisms, which can in turn bring more nutrients to the plant, make the soil healthier, and then that healthy soil leads to more carbon uptake, which leads to healthier soil. And it's really a virtuous cycle. So I'm talking a lot here about healthy soil and healthy soil is kind of key to this whole concept of regenerative agriculture and carbon sequestration. And I'm really curious to know, what do you think is the definition of healthy soil? How would you define it? Go ahead and write your answers in the chat. I'm really curious to see what you think. Ah, I gave it away. Hopefully no one saw that. Go ahead and tell me, um, tell me your thoughts in the chat if you have any thoughts on the definition of healthy soil. All right. Um, so I'm not sure if I just can't see the chat or, or what, but I'm sure that there are a lot of great answers coming in, a lot of microorganisms, organics, full of life. I mean, the key word being microbiology in there. Hmm. Okay, thank you for rescuing me, Ken. That's totally correct. I'm glad to hear a lot of people are saying microbiology and microorganisms, because that's completely right. Um, and you got the, the main answer, which again is life. Um, and I like to think of healthy soil as having sort of a three-part definition. Um, it's structured, it's rich in organic matter, and finally it is alive, full of microorganisms. So let's talk about why each of these are important. Why is it important for soil to be structured? What does that mean? So soil structure is important because all of the things that we value as humans about soil, in other words, the functions that soil can provide, depend on the soil having a healthy structure. So for the soil to be able to absorb nutrients, to filter water, to support the roots of plants, it needs to have a strong structure. And what I mean by a good, strong soil structure is that it has a structure that's kind of like a sponge. It includes um, a lot of organic matter, bacteria, and fungal hyphae, which are like the long little tiny roots of the fungus, which weave through everything. And this means that this, the soil, when you pick it up, you can squeeze it together into sort of a, a clump because it has a sticky structure and different uh, clods throughout the soil that form this, this spongy structure. If you just pick up a handful of dust, for example, you can imagine that when you pick it up, it will just run through your fingers and disappear like dust in the wind. Similarly, if you just pick up a handful of sand, it's easy for it to just run away and disappear. But when that soil is held together by fungus, organic matter, um, clay and different, different molecules, it can stick together and form this healthy spongy structure. And we know that this has big benefits. For example, a 1% increase in soil organic matter, which supports a healthy structure, means that soil can hold 20,000 gallons more water per acre. Can you imagine this is a huge benefit for farmers who may be struggling with water availability to be able to have this extra reserve of water during times of drought? 
Now, why is organic matter important? Well, basically it supports a proper structure, but the reason for that is because when organic materials such as dead leaves or dead micro, um, microorganisms or roots from the plants go into the soil, it can gradually break down into a more stable kind of molecule. In other words, organic matter or humus. And humus um, is a very complicated, complex molecule. And here is just one interpretation of how it looks. And you can see it looks very complicated, kind of like a, a tumbleweed or a coil of barbed wire. And because that molecule is so complicated, it acts as sort of a, a sieve or a, a Velcro almost for nutrients and water that are coming into the soil. That complex molecule can grab onto all these other elements and hold them there for plants to access. And because it's complex, it sticks together, forms these claws and structures, and can enable the soil to function. And then my favorite part of this is the life in the soil. And these petri dishes are some beautiful cultures of soil fungus. And you can see when they're cultured in this way to make them visible to our eyes, what a tremendous, beautiful variety of life there is in the soil. Soil is a community. It's just like a city um, or a country of different organisms with different functions, all working together um, to make that soil full of life and full of nutrients. And because the life in the soil is what enables it to take up carbon, and in fact, the life in the soil is made of carbon, more life in that soil means there is more carbon in that soil and more carbon coming out of the atmosphere. And of course, as I've mentioned um, many times, the fungus is supporting that soil structure. So one of my favorite facts about the soil, in fact, is that a tablespoon of healthy soil has more microorganisms in it than there are people on the earth, which I think is just amazing. It's an almost unimaginable amount of biodiversity in that tiny bit of soil. So again, there's things that we as individuals can do to contribute to the health of soil. We can build our own soil right at home. And I know since I'm talking um, in a talk hosted by Lingso, a lot of you are probably avid gardeners and are really familiar with the idea of building your soil at home. And I just want to go over a couple of the ways to do that. One that I really like because it's also really important to biodiversity is by using native plants that are well adapted to your local ecosystem that are not gonna need as much synthetic inputs and disruptive care and that are also going to interact really well with the microbiology of your, of your soil and also the, you know, the wild animals in your backyard. Um, if you have a chance to use perennials, that's also really great. It allows your soil to remain undisturbed as that plant grows year after year. Compost and mulch are also amazing opportunities to add more organic material to your soil, which can then break down into organic matter and humus. And of course, the more you can reduce your synthetic chemicals, the better, because those synthetic chemicals are really disruptive to the life in your soil, especially pesticides. And finally, it's great if you can reduce the amount of tilling you're doing and reduce the compaction of the soil, because that's disruptive to that structure. There's techniques like um, creating no-dig beds that can use um, a method for gardening without, without any tillage and without so much disruption of the soil. So this is, a, this is you know, ways to achieve that healthy soil in your own backyard. How do farmers do this on a, on a larger scale? Of course, they use a lot of the same techniques, um, but they use some different techniques as well. So when farmers make the effort primarily to build up their soil and try to change the paradigm of extracting from the soil and instead regenerate it, this is what we call regenerative agriculture. And of course, that's a really broad definition, right? Farmers who try to build up the soil. Well, that's of course very broad because there's many different ways to do this. But at its base, regenerative agriculture is a strategy that focuses on rebuilding and improving soil and the agricultural ecosystem rather than extracting from it and destroying it. It's a suite of techniques that go together to form that, um, that term of regenerative agriculture. And these include reducing your tillage, adding compost, using cover crops, and a few other things that I'll go over. And of course, this term is broad and sometimes it's even controversial. So we can hopefully get into that a little bit as well. So the main techniques of regenerative agriculture that I want to highlight are um, the use of cover crops, often along with compost, the use of techniques like no-till or reduced tillage, 
and the use of techniques that involve trees, um, such as agroforestry, and we'll get into each of these in detail. I want to first look at cover crops and compost. And the main point of cover crops is that it's preventing you from having exposed soil. When the cover crops are covering the soil, then water is more easily able to go into the soil because there's a sort of more um, varied texture on the top of the soil for the water to filter into. And that soil can't blow away because it's being held down and grabbed onto by the roots of those plants. Um, and if you pick the right cover crops, they can also have other beneficial impacts as well. The cover crop I have pictured here is vetch, and that's a legume, which means it can fix nitrogen out of the atmosphere without the use of lightning. And it can put that nitrogen into the soil by interacting with microorganisms. So cover crops are a key aspect of regenerative agriculture. And the second key aspect is reduced tillage. And as I mentioned before, when that tillage happens, it turns over the soil, it exposes that soil to the atmosphere, and then you get oxidation and CO2 and loss of that carbonaceous organic matter from your soil. And of course, the water is also very easy to evaporate from the soil when it's exposed to the sun and the wind. When you don't till the soil and when you leave the crop residues or the leftover stems and leaves from your previous crop on the soil, you're not only avoiding the disruption of the soil, but you're also creating a, a mulch that covers your soil, protects it, and adds more organic matter. Another way to reduce tillage is with perennial crops. So by using crops that don't die every year, you're able to keep getting, um, keep getting a harvest from those crops without having to disturb the soil and replant at all. My favorite aspect of regenerative agriculture is definitely the aspect that involves trees because I am a huge fan of trees. I love them. And I want to talk about this for a couple of minutes. Um, one way that uh, regenerative agriculture can involve trees is through alley cropping, which, as the name suggests, means you're growing crops in the alleys between rows of trees. In this picture, there's a person who's growing grains in between their trees. And that's a really popular application of alley cropping. The trees do produce some shade, which can sometimes impact the yields of the grain. But especially if you're using trees, which also produce a cash crop, like a fruit or a nut tree, the economic returns on that land can often be higher with the trees than without. And those trees are also providing benefits like wind protection to your crops. Another way to incorporate trees is with riparian buffers and hedgerows. These are trees that form a border along your fields. In the case of riparian buffers, a border along waterways, which protects the waterway from erosion along the banks and also from excess fertilizer or pesticides flowing into that waterway. And in the case of hedgerows, between the fields where they're going to shelter your crops from wind. These kind of buffers and hedgerows are also going to be great habitats for beneficial insects that can help to naturally control harmful insect populations on a farm. So they're really great all around and they can even provide habitat for wild biodiversity like birds, for example. And there's also increasingly a movement toward exploring the concept of food forests and permaculture. And this is a kind of agriculture in which they aim to imitate or replicate the abundant and really complex ecology of a forest. When you go into a forest, you see that there is so many different levels. There is the higher canopy of the trees, uh, maybe a lower canopy of smaller trees, shrubs, grasses, herbaceous cover, fungus, mushrooms, you know, growing among the roots. And by imitating that style of having so many different layers and a really full and abundant ecosystem, food forests aim to achieve a high productivity in a small area while also reducing the need for synthetic inputs because they're creating a balanced ecosystem that hosts a lot of really diverse insect populations and diverse animal populations that keep each other in check and prevent any um, negative impacts on the crops. So all of these techniques so far have been um, pretty widely accepted within the regenerative agriculture movement. Of course, new science is coming in on them all the time, which is always exciting uh, exploration of, you know, which ones may fit best together and what the exact level of impact of the different techniques might be among different ecosystems, because of course they're quite context dependent. 
But I also want to get into a topic that can be a little bit more controversial, even within the regenerative agriculture movement. And I think it's important to really be informed um, about whatever choices you make when you explore regenerative agriculture. And so, of course, I wanted to take a few minutes and talk about grazing. Um, now, most of the meat in the US is raised at least for part of its life in what's called a concentrated animal feeding operation or a CAFO. And in these CAFOs, you see that the animals are um, kept in fairly close quarters. They're fed on um, usually corn or soy. And of course, because they are um, ruminant animals, as I mentioned earlier, they're fermenting the feed in their gut and they're producing um, methane and nitrous oxide. Now CAFOs, aside from their global warming effects, also have really problematic environmental impacts locally. They can produce um, a lot of gases and really bad smells and these can lead to asthma in surrounding communities. And they can also be a point source of lo local water pollution. For example, if waste from the animals is stored in a waste lagoon, that waste can pollute the groundwater or if there is, for example, a flood can get into nearby bodies of water and create a huge amount of pollution. So these CAFOs are very problematic and have really negative environmental impacts. Now, uh, as part of the regenerative agriculture movement, there's people developing techniques called regenerative grazing. And this um, technique aims to offset some of those negative impacts of animals by managing them in such a way that it aims to rebuild the soil, just like regenerative agriculture that I was mentioning earlier. And this includes keeping the animals in small tight groups and moving them quickly between different fields or subfields where they graze for just a week or even a few days. And this type of management aims to imitate a natural cycle of herbivores. And by trampling the grass, eating the grass, um, it encourages more root growth and more above ground growth of the grass as well. And this adds more organic matter to the soil, which as we've discussed, improves its function and improves its carbon sequestration potential. So this is all great. And it is a very valid thing to be doing with grazing. But we also have to remember that even with regenerative grazing, the animals doing the grazing are still those same cows that we discussed a moment ago. They are still producing methane. They're still producing nitrous oxide from their waste. And so it's definitely um, a very context specific balance as to whether regenerative grazing is the best use of land and whether it's having a positive or negative impact on the climate. In some particular circumstances, especially if soil is very degraded, uh, regenerative grazing can be carbon negative because so much carbon sequestration is happening in the soil. But of course, this is limited because the soil can only take up so much carbon and eventually those systems will no longer be carbon negative. Um, of course, it's also important to remember that there are some lands on which regenerative grazing is practiced that aren't suitable for other kinds of agriculture. So in those cases, it can be a beneficial um, way to practice agriculture. But then again, there are some lands on which regenerative grazing is practiced, which may be able to go to better uses. For example, returning them to a wild ecosystem or providing habitat for wildlife biodiversity. So, you know, it's it's excellent to seek out regeneratively grown meat if you do want to seek out meat, um, especially regeneratively grown beef, because that can offset some of the negative impacts of grazing, although often not all of them. But being able to reduce your meat consumption, even by a little bit, is one of the best things that we as individuals can do um, for the climate through our food choices. So just to recap, um, after that kind of intense discussion, um, I want to uh, recap and say that conventional farming often is based on a lot of tillage, exposed soil, monocrops, synthetic chemicals, CAFOs, and basically it can when used incorrectly lead to significant destruction and extraction from ecosystems. Regenerative farming aims to flip that and really work on restoring the ecosystem by having diverse crops, keeping the soil covered, putting more roots in the ground um, and integrating animals in a way that is least harmful to the environment and can even have environmental benefits in some contexts. So, I want to add one of the other great things about regenerative agriculture is that it's not a question of like, do we want to have one benefit or the other benefit? With regenerative agriculture, it brings along a lot of co-benefits as well. 
So these include the ability to support and protect pollinators like this super adorable little carpenter bee here, um, because we may be um, providing native habitats with these riparian buffers or hedgerows and with cover crops, we can provide flowers for those bees to feed on um, for a much more lengthy time of the year, excuse me, for a much longer time of the year. Um, it provides the benefits of water retention, which is good for farmers, but it's also good for our natural ecosystems, estuaries, um, like this slough here that you see, this is nice California slough. And then of course, my favorite is biodiversity and wildlife habitat. Um, farming, it's possible for it to work with biodiversity and wildlife habitat, especially when incorporating native plants and trees, for example, in riparian buffers. Just one example, and it's a great example, of regenerative agriculture that's being practiced in California is Singing Frogs Farm. And this is a really beautiful 10-year-old farm in Sebastopol. And they have provided a great example of practicing regenerative agriculture. And you can see here, there is a link where you can go and check out a great video they've given on how they build their soil and how they use compost as part of their system. And I think they're such a great farm. They're certified as bee friendly. And one of the great things that I want to link back to my earlier mention of social issues, they employ their employees year round. So they provide a much more sustainable, stable lifestyle for those employees. Um, and it's not a, not a sacrifice for them because they're actually able to produce six times the California average of, of vegetable production each year. So it's a pretty incredible example of regenerative agriculture in action. So again, what can we do as individuals? Well, of course we can, you know, reduce our food waste, we can build our soil at home, but how can we support the farmers who are doing the incredible work of transforming our food system more broadly to be regenerative? One of the best things we can do is to use our own consumer power. We can vote with our dollars, or as I like to put it, vote with our forks, which I think sounds a lot more fun and use that consumer power to buy food that's grown regeneratively and support those regenerative farmers. Um, one excellent way to do this is to sign up for a CSA, a Community Supported Agriculture um, subscription. It's basically like a subscription box for your fruits and vegetables. And when you do this, you can connect with an individual farm, sign up ahead of time for them to send you these boxes of produce for a certain period. And this has become especially popular um, because of the COVID-19 pandemic. People have really seen how fragile how long and twisted and convoluted uh, and difficult to understand our food supply chain is. They want to get closer to their local farms. And so people have been signing up for CSAs left and right. And it's a great option because you can zero in on an individual farm whose practices you really support. And often, not now, but in normal times, these farms will even welcome visitors to come and check out their practices. And you can see how your individual food is being grown, which I think is extremely exciting. And hopefully in the future, there's currently work on a regenerative organic certified um, certification for foods. And this certification has been developed really recently. It's past its piloting stage and it will hopefully soon be available on foods that you might see in the grocery store. And this will offer another way for consumers such as me or you to seek out regeneratively grown foods, especially if like me, you were a little late on the um, bandwagon of CSA signups this year and everyone else had already signed up for them due to COVID-19. So look out for this regenerative organic certification and hopefully it will soon be available in a grocery store near you. Now, when we talk about farmers and individuals transforming the food system, it's a lot to ask. Oh, sorry. Um, it's a lot to ask of an individual farmer or an individual consumer to really create a transformation of the food system. And of course, everyone can contribute with their individual choices, but one of the most effective ways to push for this transformation on a larger scale is by pushing the government and pushing our representatives to move these policies forward that support these practices. So what is the government doing to support regenerative agriculture? Well, I'm really proud to say actually that California state government is one of the leaders in the US in terms of supporting climate smart regenerative agriculture and even uh, in global terms, California is a really great example of this. 
of course, I think we still have a lot farther to go, even in California, but I want to outline some of the great policies that we have here in this state. So there's a suite of policies that are called the Climate Smart Agricultural Policies, and these include the Healthy Soils Program, which focuses on giving farmers grants to Im uh, improve their soil practices. There's the SWEET program, which focuses on sustainable water use. The ANT program, which focuses on sustainable manure management. So manure management that reduces GHG emissions. And the Sustainable, um, sustainable Agricultural Lands Conservation Program, which of course focuses on land conservation and keeping um, land that's being used for sustainable agriculture in sustainable agricultural production rather than being turned into an office park or an apartment building. And I'm really hopeful actually recently because we've seen a few different signs that California is going to continue its commitment to regenerative agricultural policies. One is the governor's recent executive order that came out just a week or so ago and this executive order recognized two things. Um, it focused uh, in part on protecting California's wild lands and taking up the 30 by 30 initiative. So protecting 30% of wild lands by 2030. But the other thing in that executive order was um, recognizing the value of soil for achieving California's climate goals and achieving California's GHG greenhouse gas reduction goals. So the fact that the governor recognize that in his executive order is really exciting to us in the regenerative agriculture field. And another way that this is integrated into state planning is through the planning of the California Air Resources Board, CARB. And they are currently going through a process to identify certain pathways by which California can achieve its goals. And one of the things they're including in those is an examination of what's called natural and working lands. In other words, natural wild lands such as parks and um, state recreation areas, and then working lands like agriculture and rangelands. So identifying those as a priority is really exciting, but as a um, Sierra Club committee and as individuals, we really have to keep pushing for these policies to be supported. For example, this year, because of the financial crisis due to COVID, the Healthy Soils Program actually hasn't received any funding. So even though there was a huge demand from farmers for that Healthy Soil Program grants last year, not even all of the farmers' um, requests were able to be fulfilled. This year, there may not be funding for any of those farmers to be able to improve their practices. So we have to keep pushing. Again, what can we do? We can raise awareness of healthy soils among our friends, among our neighbors, the more people who are aware of this issue, the more people are likely to vote on it, to push for it, um, and to support these policies. We can, of course, support healthy soil policies ourselves, and we can hold our representatives accountable for supporting healthy soil policies as well. It's a very reasonable thing, especially in California, where agriculture is so important, to ask your representative, you know, what are you doing to support the healthy soils program? What are you doing to bring innovative solutions that really fulfill the potential of agriculture to fight climate change. Um, what's your plan? You can ask your representatives these things. And in terms of specific actions to take, I would highly recommend checking out an organization called California Climate and Agriculture Network, CalCAN. There is a link to their website here on the slide and also uh, later. And you can check out their action alert page um, to see what, what specific actions they recommend around particular bills. So as you yourself want to learn more, dig into this topic, there's a couple resources I really recommend. One is Civil Eats. It's an online magazine with hundreds of excellent, really critical investigative articles about sustainable food. It really gets into the topics deeply, but it's also really accessible to the lay person. And um, it's just a really excellent resource if you want to start learning more about regenerative food and what kind of choices you can make to to vote with your fork and vote with your with your ballot regular voting um and then i'm also going to recommend a couple more documentary style resources one is an invitation to wildness there is a, a link just below the image of the um of the screenshot there and this is a really short documentary. It's about 25 minutes, it's available on YouTube. And it's about someone who creates a beautiful food forest in New Zealand. And it really beautifully explains this concept and why it's, uh, it's so important for us to be following. And the third thing I wanna recommend is a more feature length documentary. It's called Kiss the Ground. And it recently came out on Netflix. 
it's been really popular and I'm so happy to see that this message um, of soil, soil health is made really accessible by this film. It's a, it's a really uplifting and inspiring film as well. And, you know, it is a little bit optimistic. It is um, a little bit simple on some of the issues that we went into in more depth in this presentation, but it's a great way to get your friends and neighbors into this issue as well in a really exciting way. Finally, you can go ahead and check out some of these groups. The links will be available on the slides. And you can keep in touch with me and with the Sierra Club Sustainable Agriculture Committee. We have a Facebook page, a website, and you can also email me at this extremely long email um, and get in touch at any time if you're interested in, in following our work. So thank you again for coming and I'm really excited to answer people's questions and maybe have a discussion around some of these topics. Alrighty, so let me start out. There were a couple questions on the chat there, so we can start off with that um, and see if we can address um, address those. So, um, apologize in advance if I'm butchering anybody's names, but I'll try my best. So, this question is from Bobby: um, Is putting nitrogen back into the soil generally true about all legumes? And I think Nancy answered this one, but it'd be interesting to just sort of. Um, Either Nancy, you could share that, or Mary, if you have thoughts on that, um, to address that specific question there. Sure, well, Nancy, um, I'll go ahead and read off Nancy's answer in the interest of, of time. She basically said, yes, legumes associate with bacteria, with pisses, nitrogen, or makes nitrogen in nodules in the plant roots. So Nancy, that's a great answer. And basically the definition of legumes, um, they're a type of plant and plants in this family are fixing nitrogen in the way that Nancy described. It's really cool if you dig up the roots of, for example, soybeans, vetch, fava beans, etc. You can see little tiny globules on the roots and that's the sort of home they make for the nitrogen fixing bacteria. So it's a super great example of a, a biological partnership. Okay. And the next question is from Rick and Rick asked, I see a great deal of tillage in the farms going through the Sacramento Valley and is the soil replenished with organic matter? Um, I'm not sure what percentage of farms in the Sacramento Valley are being replenished with organic matter. Um, when you see farms that are organic, uh, even organic farms often use a lot of tillage, but they have to have a plan that is um, aiming to rebuild their soil or aiming to improve their soil. So I'm assuming that organic farms would be uh, replenishing the organic matter in their soil, even if they are um, practicing tillage. About a third, I think, of agriculture in California is organic. So it's likely that around maybe a third of those farms that you were seeing are using organic practices and adding organic matter to the soil, but probably not all of them. Many of them are likely using synthetic fertilizer. Yeah. And um, the next question is from Maricris, I believe. And um, they're asking any CSA recommendations who delivers or picks up, pick up um, at San Mateo County? Um, so I don't personally know off the top of my head, but I have a recommendation for you, which is to look up an organization called Kitchen Table Advisors, and they have, they're, a, they're an organization that provides business consulting to sustainable farms, and they have a list on their website of farms that do pick up CSAs by region in the Bay Area, including San Mateo County. So you can start there, um, and if you find that all of those are full, you can you know, continue to do research because there's plenty of great sustainable farms that aren't um, clients of kitchen table advisors. So you'll just have to look around online, but most, uh, most of these farms, if they do a CSA, they're going to have a website and you will probably be able to find a, a good one. Okay, so next question is from um, Pierce. And um, the question is, what are the best plans for reducing carbon? We assume trees, but for instance, some ivies grow much, grows much faster. Should we examine which plants actually do the best job? Mm. So that's a really great question. And um, the answer, which so many of my college professors gave me was it depends. And it really does depend. It depends on the ecosystem, on what plants are going to grow best in that ecosystem and what plants are going to work best with the 
microorganisms in that soil and the soil type. However, um, one plant type that is generally really good for sequestering carbon other than trees is perennial grasses. So perennial grasses can put down tremendous, huge root systems. And when those grasses die, or when some of the roots die, that can be broken down and stabilized into organic matter in the soil. So perennial grasses, especially native perennial grasses, which are gonna work best with that ecosystem, can be great options for carbon sequestration. And on that note, I will add that um, we do have a cover cropping class coming up next month. If anybody's interested in the specific varieties of cool season cover crops and warm season cover crops. So just check out the links on the website and, uh, and you can sign up for that as well. So we'll move on to the next question from Ben. Um, I realize the theme is regenerative soil for farming and food production. Do you recommend similar practices for ornamentals or non-food vegetations? Um, yeah, I think that's a great question. A lot of um, people with backyards aren't necessarily farming corn in the backyard. Um, and I think that these practices are totally applicable to non-food plants. And in a way, I think you even have a greater opportunity with non-food plants to practice these regenerative practices and do a little bit of carbon sequestration at home in your backyard because so many food plants are annuals. And also by definition, if you have a food plant, you're taking away some of that biomass to feed you know, yourself in the form of fruit or leaves, et cetera. And so many, um, you know, so, and you can, you can choose rather than being constrained by what's edible to you, you can choose much more based on what's suitable for your ecosystem and you know, what are the perennial plants maybe that can be decorative and you can, you can have a lot more options for native plants, perennial plants, deep-rooted grasses that are not edible and will not be farmed by farmers, but can be very beautiful and decorative and sequester carbon. Okay, so next question is from Nancy. Do some industrial crops such as corn deplete the soil or are non-regenerative managed more than others? Um. So I think this is kind of a two-part question. Do some industrial crops such as corn deplete the soil? So I would say that in general, most any crop that's going to be grown industrially will some Mary, I think we lost you there. There we go. <laughs> uh oh. Those practices that are going to be depleting the soil. Of course, some crops are more nutrient hungry than others, and corn, I think, is a, a very hungry crop. Um, but it's really more about the practices of managing it that makes it more or less regenerative. And the second part is are, are non regenerative managed more than others? I would actually say that regeneratively managing crops in some ways is going to require more management because it requires more monitoring and more adjusting and feedback, a more, a more flexible approach to management. Because for example, if you see one year you're getting a certain type of pest, you're going to have to think about ways to balance that the next year. Whereas in very pesticide heavy industrial agricultural methods, you're able to just basically kill everything and grow your crop. And then if things come, you just kill them. And um, that is, a, you know, in a sense, a less challenging form of management. Mary, we sort of lost you there for the first part of the, the question there. So if you don't mind, just briefly summarize what you had just said for the first sure. part. Yeah, I was, I was just saying that because regenerative growing is trying to be more in harmony with nature and use less synthetic inputs, it can require a more flexible management style, which requires more, more balance and more attentiveness to what's going on in the climate and with the animals and so on. So it can actually require more intensive management in the sense of more thinking and planning. Thank you. 
Um, so <clears throat> we'll move on to the next question. What are no-till and low-till methods for heavy clay soils that we haven't grown uh, ornamentals or food plants in? Mm, so I would recommend really thinking about starting with a nice cover crop blend for your clay soils. Um, and it sounds like there will be a great class on that next week um, because one of the uses of a cover crop is to not only add nutrients and not only cover the soil, but it can also be to condition that soil and break it up. Um, I'm sure you've seen maybe walking down a sidewalk in an older neighborhood where the sidewalk is just completely bent and buckled by the tree roots. This can really tell you how strong those roots are. And one type of cover crop is called a tillage radish. And this is a radish that's not particularly delicious, but the whole point of the radish is you plant it, it has an incredibly strong taproot that shoots down into the soil and can really break that soil structure up. And then you wait for the radish to die, it rots under the soil and adds a lot of organic matter and really loosens everything up. So cover crops are a great um, thing to look into in terms of starting out your, your growth in clay soils. Okay, so the next question is, um, are rice fields regenerative? Ooh, that is such a great question. Okay, um, I'm not gonna exactly answer that because it's, it's not so much a question of being regenerative, but I'm so glad someone asked about rice because uh, that was kind of my favorite topic in college was, was rice farming. And rice farming is very, very interesting because the method by which rice is grown with the flooded patties is, um, can create a lot of greenhouse gas emissions because that creates an anaerobic, a non-oxygenated environment underneath the water where that organic matter is rotting and producing methane. But on the other hand, in California, for example, we see that those rice patties are kind of creating wetlands and they're creating a place for migratory birds to land and live. So there's a lot of research right now going on around rice, um, how rice can be grown with less water in order to reduce the methane emissions and how that can be balanced with uh, providing, excuse me, providing the habitat that it's historically provided for, for wildlife. So rice fields in and of themselves aren't necessarily regenerative or non-regenerative. I think rice fields could be regenerative, um, but they can also produce a lot of methane. I can't necessarily give you a yes or no because the science is still developing, but it's fascinating. Alrighty, so the next question um, is sort of a, a, a two-parter. Um, Sylvia asks, we have two acre hillside with grasses and weeds that we mow mm -hmm. yearly. We have lots of wildfire rodents, hawks, coyote, et cetera. So what type of perennial grasses would you recommend? And could you recommend two things we could do to increase biodiversity and habitat? So the first part, what type of perennial grasses would you recommend? Um, I would uh, encourage you to attend the cover cropping class for that, but Mary, I'm gonna let you uh, answer that as well. <laughs> okay, well, I'll second that. Um, I can't actually recommend like a particular perennial grass variety off the top of my head. I'm sure there's gonna be some great recommendations from the cover crop class. If you want um, to look strictly at wild grasses, I think you can look at, um, I think the National Wildlife Federation has some great websites about native plant biodiversity where you can look up native plants that are suitable to your area. And I think there is one that's specific to California as well. The name is escaping me at the moment. I can try to send that link out later. Um, in terms of increasing biodiversity in a habitat, if it's possible, I'd really recommend planting some native trees. Um, I think having, uh, or native shrubs as well, I think having multiple levels of, in terms of height, and also in terms of the type of plant that you are supporting can really boost up your biodiversity. And I recently attended a great webinar that described native trees as being like bird feeders, because those native trees are supporting native insects and they're supporting huge amounts of caterpillars and birds, basically their favorite food is caterpillars. We see them eating seeds all the time, but what they really love is caterpillars. So when you're able to plant a native tree, you are planting a bird feeder for native birds, basically, and wildlife habitat for many other um, wild animals as well. So I'd recommend, I guess the two things would be 
plant some trees and maybe plant some native shrubs as well. So you have multiple uh, canopy levels. All right, and I see Anne. Oh, hi, Anne. Um, and yes, sheet mulching is a great, great idea, a way to add lots of organic material to clay soils. I think there's one question here. This may have been emailed in earlier, but are there any downsides to using gray water systems on residential landscape? Um, that's a little outside of my purview. I, I have to assume that it probably, you know, depends on how you're using your gray water system um, and what kind of gray water is going in. Of course, soil can be a great filter for any kind of water contaminants, but you want to be careful about contaminants when you're spraying it on top. But there are very safe ways to do gray water systems. However, yes. I'm not an expert, so you'll have to look it up yourself. <laughs> and in fact, we typically, in fact, we typically have a gray water laundry to landscape uh, class uh, here at Linkso. So if you're interested in that, look forward to that. We won't have it this year, but um, in spring of next year, we'll have that as well. And there are a lot of uh, laundry to landscape uh, rebates that the county's offering. So um, if you're interested in particularly about how your gray water affects soil, please do email me and I'll give you the resources for that um, in particular. Um, I might have seen that webinar, it sounds great. <laughs> um, let's see here. So I think I think pretty much that's all we've got as far as um, questions. Do anyone else have any other questions for Mary regarding this uh, class that we just attended? If oh, and so I see that Eloise has provided fine native grasses specific to your zip code and she's provided a link here. So that looks fantastic. I'm sure that would be really helpful. There you go. Uh, the last question from Bar Barbara is, how can I find out about the Air Resources Board and Ag? Ah, that is a great question. Um, so the Air Resources Board, I, I was surprised when I found out how important the Air Resources, Board, Air Resources Board is to how agriculture is being included in climate change planning in California. Um, they are just starting out their um, scoping process for creating the 2022 plan for how California can achieve its climate goals. And so they're still figuring out how agriculture is going to be included in that. And that's something that the Sustainable Agriculture Committee is hoping to be a part of and really advocate for that being included prominently in, in the plan. And I think that um, if you keep an eye on the CalCAN website, you may see updates there. If you go to the California Air Resources Board website, you, I believe, can also sign up for updates from them and you can access uh, signups for their public public hearings. And that is that is probably the best place to look into that right now because it's just really just getting started. Okay, so um, <clears throat> do you know of any other states that are close behind California in terms of leading on policy to support regenerative agriculture? Hmm. I actually do not know that much about the policies of other states. For some reason, Colorado is coming to mind, but I'm not sure if that's maybe because they have some good policies around solar. Um, that's a really good question, and I'm afraid I, I can't give you a clear answer. I can look into that. And then I see Eloise is asking, what portion or branch of the Sierra Club are you with? Are you a volunteer? Um, yes, I am a volunteer and I am the chairperson of the statewide state California State Sustainable Agriculture Committee. So um, Eloise, I'm guessing maybe you're a Sierra Club member who is interested in learning more. If you go on the Sierra Club California website, you can see a tab for issues. Um, and if you look under issues on the Sierra Club California website, you can see the issue agriculture. And that will take you to that website that I shared in one of those last slides, the link to which will be available when we send the slides out. And you can learn more about our position within the Sierra Club um, from that website. Okay, we have a new question uh, coming in. So it's um, by Tracy here. My family has a farm and we're figuring out best ways 
ways to have reduced till? Do you have a good resource or book that goes into details on equipment and planting techniques? Um, so I don't necessarily have a book to recommend. I'm sure there are some great books out there, but I do have a, um, a place for you to start. Are you familiar maybe with your local resource conservation district? Where, um, Tracy, where is your family's farm? San Mateo, okay. So you can look into the San Mateo County RCD and um, they'll probably have a website. In fact, I think I've seen their website and it's pretty good. So if you look up San Mateo County RCD, you can probably find contact information for your RCD resource conservation district and they'll be able to connect you hopefully with resources around how to improve your farm planning um, or maybe even have a consultation or a class that you can attend. So I would say for those of you who are in California or I think generally living in the US, your resource conservation district is going to be a great resource for um, locally specific practices and, and resources that you can use on your own farm. That's a, that's a great question, Tracy, and I'm glad I got to mention the RCDs because they're really, really a big part of uh, farming in California. Okay, and to add on uh, top of that, I do have a couple resources for the books. I'll be able to email you folks along with, uh, with um, our contact information and the PDF copy of the presentation as well as the recording. Um, and in fact, um, Mary, a lot of folks were asking if we could type in um, the email address that was presented in the presentation just in the chat here for their immediate reference. Uh, before I send out uh, the grand email. I'll go ahead and copy and paste that in the chat. I know it's a super long email. It's so it's so hard to come up with an email now that 100 other people haven't already got. Okay. <laughs> um, let me go ahead and send that to everyone. Whoops. Nope. That is a link to the New York Times. Copy that. And if folks have specific questions regarding upcoming classes or anything mentioned in the, in the presentation today, you're welcome to email me as well. Um, I will be sending out an email to those who are subscribed to our clinic list um, for the list of classes coming up in November as well as in December. Um, so if there are no other questions uh, or comments, we can adjourn. <laughs> All right. I just want to say I've, I've gone ahead and put my email there. Um, and I just want to say thank you so much to everyone for these great questions, for your great responses during the webinar. It was really an honor to speak with all of you. So thank you. And I hope you have a great day uh, gardening. Yeah. And thank Thanks. you so much, Mary, for this wonderful class and, and really exciting to be part of this grander movement. And we really need that in California. So and thanks, everybody, for attending this talk as well. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, you. Bye. thank you. Thank you, Ken, for hosting this. It's really been a very easy, very easy webinar. Thank you so much. All righty, guys. Bye-bye.